what I'd like to do is tell a short story about how the field of history of science, how we study the history of science has changed over those 40 years. When I started, when I was in the university, when you studied the history of science, you studied the history of theories. You studied the history of Ptolemy's theory of the universe, or you studied the history of Newtonian gravity, or you studied the history of Charles Darwin's theory of evolution. It was the big ideas that we studied. And then in the 1990s, uh, there was a kind of shift. Historians like to talk about turns, where there's a turn from one kind of question to a turn for another, to another kind of question. And in the 90s, people started saying, well, yes, science produces these big theories, but how does it do it? Uh, what do scientists actually do to produce theories? Uh, how do they work in the field? How do they work in laboratories? How do they, how do they design experiments, etc.? And this turn was called the practical turn where you moved from theory to what was called the realm of scientific practice. And that means you start following scientists, not just when they publish their big papers with the theory or write a big book like Darwin's theory on evolution, but instead you study Darwin very carefully when he's on the Beagle and you look at his diaries and you look at his notes and you see exactly how he was interacting day by day with nature. Well, in the area that I've worked, uh, it was moving into the laboratory and watching how experimental scientists were trying to produce what were called facts and then trying to produce knowledge out of that in their laboratory. And in laboratories, there are tools. And those tools are going to be starting in the 19th century called scientific instruments. So the, the practical turn uh, one of the things to, that, that, that showed this was a, a very important book that was published uh, in the uh, late 80s called The Leviathan and the Air Pump. Uh, and this was one of the first books in the history of science that actually had an instrument, an air pump, in the title. Uh, it turns out that uh, that book still was very much at a high level of theory. Uh, some of us think that the authors really never looked at air pumps very much. Uh, but nonetheless, that was an important book for, for moving the field to start to look at scientific instruments. Likewise, in the 1980s, uh, an international group of curators and historians of science uh, started something called the Scientific Instrument Commission. These were people that worked with collections of historic scientific instruments, uh, and I became part of this. Uh, and my, the, the focus of my study in history of science shifted from the big ideas to laboratory practice, and even more specifically, to the instruments that were used in laboratory practice. Turns out that my university in the United States, Dartmouth College, is one of the oldest universities in North America. Of course, this is not very old compared to European standards. Coimbra was much older than, 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 than our university, to say nothing of Padua or Oxford or Paris. But we were started in the, in the 1760s, so that's 250 years. And my university had, ha, has a, a collection of historic scientific apparatus. Nobody started to make this collection. The scientists simply didn't throw things away. Uh, and so old apparatus starts to build up. And uh, about uh, 50 years ago, a physics professor at my university started to collect and, and put this material together. And now we have the second or the third largest collection in North America at a university. So I had a set of you know, 4,000, 5,000 objects, uh, various kinds of scientific instruments at my disposal. I could teach seminars with students, I could make exhibits, and uh, I started to, to uh, study instruments. And this is now, in terms of history of science, we call it studying the material culture, studying the artifacts that make science possible, laboratories, buildings, observatories, instruments, materials, etc. This is now a big stream uh, in the history of science. So it's been a big change from this theory focused to the instrument focused. Um, I like, to, I like to look at instruments as places very concrete to tell all kinds of stories uh, about how science works. Remember, the focus is on, is on the, the practice of science. Uh, so for example, uh, one of the, the most recent things we've added to Dartmouth's collection uh, is something called a hip chronoscope. It is a clock about this big that sits on a table, and it is the first 
mechanical stopwatch that could measure time to thousandths of a second. So it could measure a millisecond. It was invented by a Swiss clockmaker about 1850. Uh, and the, the one that Dartmouth has was made about in the 1880s. So they were manufactured pretty much the same style for about 70 years. Uh, they had serial numbers. They were made by just a couple companies. So we know exactly how many there are. And uh, a scholar in Germany has written a wonderful article where he's traced all these. So we, we sort of know where these, these apparatus are. But so why does science want to measure milliseconds? Why does it want to measure a thousandth of a second? So you've got the, you've got the, the apparatus. It's a very sophisticated little mechanical mechanism that uses electricity, it uses an electromagnet to, 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 make, to move a clutch to start and stop the hands. That's the trick when you're trying to measure time mechanically at a thousandth of a second, you've got this wheel spinning very quickly and you have to stop it and start it with you know, millisecond precision. Uh, and so you have an electromagnet, by the 1820s you had electromagnetism and then by the 1850s, you get this electromagnetism built into this. But the rest of it's simply a mechanical clock. But it's very careful design with the Swiss clock making uh, that's there. Uh, so what did they do with this? So I worked with a student and we made, we made an exhibit uh, about this and it was called Catching Milliseconds. Uh, and it turns out that, that when you have this device, you can suddenly start to do all kinds of things in the physical sciences and in the human sciences that you couldn't do before. So for example, in physics, you can measure very short times. Uh, and in, in ballistics, you could measure, for example, uh, there were earlier examples of this, but you could, you could measure now how fast bullets go. So you shoot a bullet out of a gun and you have two wires and you can measure the time it takes for the bullet to go you know, this far uh, with this clock. Uh, and there were other kinds of physics things where they were measuring very short intervals. But it makes possible, and this is an example of how the instrument moves and changes science, it makes possible new ways to study the human brain. Experimental psychology is emerging right at the same time in the 1850s, 1860s. And the, the new psychologists are trying to figure out how the brain works uh, and they're using machines to measure things. And one of the things they measure are reaction times. So that when I say red, a certain word, you push a button. How long does it take for your brain to process that you said red to push a button? Well, that's milliseconds and this clock can measure. And then if I say another word, if I say a different word, let's suppose I say, uh, uh, you know, uh, freedom. Does it, take your time, does it take your brain longer to measure abstract words than it does concrete words? Well, to do that, you have to set subjects in front of this machine and you push buttons and they measured milliseconds and suddenly they had all kinds of ways, and for about 20 years, the best way to study brain function was to measure reaction times using this clock. So this, this device that was you know, sort of invented for physics turns out to make experimental psychology, a, a big research front in, in experimental psychology uh, possible. It's used in astronomy uh, to measure what's called the personal equation. Uh, so 19th century astronomical observatories, including the one in, in Lisbon, uh, would build big telescopes that were in the meridian. And what they would do is simply measure the positions of stars. 19th century was this, in astronomy, was what we call natural history time. They were simply measuring what's in the sky with increasing precision. And to do that, you have to watch, wait for a, a, a star to move across the, the meridian, the north-south line. And then when it's exactly in the middle of the meridian, the observer pushes a button. And that's a reaction time. Uh, and it turns out that some observers had slower reaction times, some had faster reaction times. And so astronomical observatories needed these hip chronoscopes uh, to, to be able to measure how fast their observers think so that they can then take that personal equation out of the data to get accurate observations for where the star actually is. Uh, another example of how this, so this instrument is, is making short time measurement possible in ways that nobody dreamed. Uh, and having an apparatus actually sitting on the desk in front of us uh, made it possible for us to then start to understand exactly what was going on in the observatory or what was going on in the experimental psychology laboratory by having the uh, device there.
Uh, well, that's just one example of one instrument. Uh, of course, there's many different kinds of instruments. Speaking of astronomy, uh, some of the earliest instruments that we talk about in the Western tradition, so-called astrolabe or armillary sphere, uh, are, are brass instruments used to measure positions and the motions in the heavens uh, of, of, of stars. You can tell time, you can find the direction to Mecca, uh, you can make a horoscope, house divisions, you can, do, you can do all kinds of things. So you've got these astronomical instruments. Uh, in the uh, 17th century, you start to get instruments of, of natural philosophy, like the air pump, where you're not just measuring nature now, but you're doing something to nature. So that the, the uh, chamber inside the air pump you're making something that doesn't appear in nature normally, right? So you can increase the pressure or you can decrease the pressure uh, and you can create an artificial environment uh, to, to explore various kinds of natural phenomena. Uh, so that's an example. The microscope and the telescope optics are going to change what can be seen uh, with, uh, in, in, the, in the 17th century. Uh, the, these kind of apparatus emerge the thermometer. Galileo is going to in, invent a thermometer, so suddenly temperature becomes something that be quantified. So, so all kinds of, of uh, to, to do experimentation with nature requires for the most part tools, some kind of apparatus, uh, and, and so you get starting in the 17th century this massive explosion of, of uh, apparatus, and um, that is now what is uh, partially preserved in museums, uh, and it's what Curators in museums and historians like of science like myself who study instruments, uh, we, we uh, look at these things. Uh, and we, we find that, uh, just one final comment, uh, in terms of working with students and training students, uh, that the material turn in the history of science means that students need to be trained in new ways. That students can learn certain things by reading about instruments, but to talk about scientific practice and to get a sense about what's going on in a laboratory, you actually need to be able to work with instruments uh, and to put on the white gloves and to manipulate the instruments to, to get a feel for what they do and the constraints that they bring into the laboratory uh, and to be able to get access to a museum collection. Uh, Coimbra has a, a fantastic uh, collection of historic apparatus uh, going back to the 17th century and uh, the 18th century. And uh, that, that gives you the possibility of, of training students in new ways to work with not just texts, but also the material artifacts from previous science. Uh, and uh, I think this, this practical turn in the history of science, is, it's been going now for, for 20 years, and it shows no sign of losing steam. Uh, I think that material studies of, of past sciences are, are, are going to continue, uh, especially when we have museum collections and university collections of apparatus that we can use to uh, train new students. Se você gostou desse vídeo, dê um like, compartilhe. Aproveite para assinar o canal e ative as notificações.